welcome to, to everybody. Um, so it's been, I'm very excited to uh, start this, uh, this series of, of discussions over the next, um, oh, there's two this week and then two at the beginning of December. Um, I'm grateful for all the kind of collaborations and all the conversations and, and relationships and friendships I've made uh, uh, during, during this, this journey. Um, so before we begin, I wanted to say not only grateful for the participants, um, the people listening tonight, um, and all those who do uh, make it their daily business to take care of this beautiful world of ours. Um, I'm grateful to the Ontario Trillium Foundation that provided us funding in which to uh, go on this year and a half long journey. Um, so not only is there, there is a webinar, but there is actually kind of video documentaries and other stuff that have been taking place over, the, over, this, uh, over this time. And it's been a tricky time for a lot of us. So getting people together during COVID and filming has been really challenging. Um, but it's also allowed people to join from other places in these kind of uh, these, these webinars. Um, I'd like to make a land acknowledgement um, for all, all the Indigenous peoples and original stewards of these lands um, and all the nations that call this uh, region of Ontario home. Um, we are all treaty people and we all have responsibility for learning the histories and struggles of the past and, and those still that play out today. Um, may we honour the Dish With One Spoon Treaty made between the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples and, and, and learn from that and taking only what we need, leaving plenty for others and giving back and that this is done with a soft dish spoon rather than a knife. So being really careful and, and cognizant of our interactions. I um, also want to acknowledge that I'm a guest here in the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. So my name is Martin Tamlin and I manage the Ignatius Old Growth Forest Project at the Ignatius Jesuit Centre in Guelph. The Old Growth Forest Project started in 2006 um, with the vision of, of protecting the lands and restoring it. Um, it consists of 100 acres of land right on the edge of the city and a uh, quickly expanding city uh, at that, like many cities in Ontario and throughout North America. So this is protected lands that we've involved the community uh, in the protection and the restoring of it. Um, it's been a fantastic and exciting journey for me. Um, the Ignatius Jesuit Centre, if you haven't uh, known much about it, um, has a mission of cultivating spiritual growth and ecological engagement. And many wonderful things happen here with community gardens and farms and training young people to be farmers, organic farmers and, and trails and ecology programs and community orchards and all sorts of wonderful things. So I feel very blessed to, to, to work here. Um, excuse me. I'm just going to read this uh, this quote uh, from uh, this book I've only just come across. Actually, um, it's called the, "The Future We Choose," and I think uh, the introduction of, of 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 who we choose to be is very pertinent to this this, this discussion and also to the course in general. Um, so I'll read this to you from "The Future We Choose," Christiana Fregares and Tom Rivet Carnac. Our current crisis requires a total shift in our thinking. To survive and thrive, we have to understand ourselves as inextricably connected to all of nature and need to cultivate a deep and abiding sense of stewardship. This transformation begins with the individual. Who we are and how we show up in the world defines how we work with others, how we interact with our surroundings, and ultimately the future we co-create. Um, and for me, that this journey calls upon collaboration, not only the, in the sharing of knowledge, but in concrete and increasingly urgent action. So with this course, we're looking at how we come to know and value knowledge and nature, how to reconcile with all our relations, understanding ecological systems, how everything is connected and how to care for the land. And finally, how we can engage ourselves and our communities in ecosystem restoration and climate change mitigation. This course has been described as, as um, towards braiding. Um, it can be seen as a two-wide uh, uh, framework of seeing. Um, and so just to explain what that means, 
Um, when we mean braided, we don't mean like making one or combining knowledge systems. It means like if you think of a, a braided rope, you know, with the, the individual strands, but kind of woven together to make that much stronger, that, that effort and that action stronger. Um, the two I've seen refers to kind of like seeing strongly out of one eye uh, from indigenous ways of, of, of knowing and from a, a kind of a Western perspective of knowing as well and bringing those two worlds in, in, into, into focus when making decisions and our more holistic look at how we care for the world. Um, so I'm going to uh, pass over to, to Molly to do a little bit of housekeeping first, and then I'm going to take a little breath before I actually start with the first presentation. Uh, thanks, Molly. All right, thank you, Martin. Um, welcome, everybody. My name is Molly Fisher. I'm the Old Growth Forest Project Assistant. Um, I'm just going to go over a couple housekeeping rules before we begin this webinar. Um, you probably all received the email that we sent out regarding um, webinar etiquette. So the first uh, thing that we should know is the chat function at the side. I see a lot of people are already introducing yourselves. Thank you very much. We'd love to know where you're coming from. If you want to type your, your name and where you're coming from into the chat there. Um, there is a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen as well. And so at the end of all of the panelists speaking, we're going to have a Q&A session. So my coworker Patrick and I will be moderating that. Um, if you do pose questions during the talks, we will be saving them until the end. And it is time sensitive a little bit. So if we don't get to your question, it's not that we're skipping it. It just may be that we ran out of time. So we appreciate all of the questions that you have to ask. Feel free to put them in the Q&A box at the bottom. If you put them in the chat, um, we will also see those. If you have any technical issues during the webinar, you can select to send a message to hosts and panelists and either Patrick or myself will respond to you and hopefully we can help you. Um, if you somehow get kicked out of the webinar for any reason and can't get back in, you can email um, OGF underscore assistant at ignatiusgolf.ca. That is also in the chat and we will try our best to help you out behind the scenes. Um, please note that this webinar is being recorded, but all of our participants are not being recorded. So your cameras and your microphones are not accessible, um, but this recording will be made available to you following the webinar session. Um, and with that, we just hope that you enjoy uh, what we have planned and prepared for you this evening. And it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker who you just heard from, Martin Tamlin. So Martin is a community builder and teacher focused on restoration ecology within a decolonized framework. Originally trained as an elementary school teacher, he has spent the last 20 years dedicated to climate change mitigation action. He has designed and led programs in environmental home building, forest gardening, permaculture design, sustainable farming, and ecology. He currently manages the Ignatius Old Growth Forest Project, where he facilitates community-led ecological restoration and nature connection programs. So Martin, we welcome you back um, to lead us through this opening webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much, Molly. Very grateful for Patrick and Molly that are helping on the back end of all this, so I don't have to think about it too much. Um, so, um, I'm going to talk about a newcomer's journey of learning and unlearning. And, and tonight, you're, during this course, you'll just hear from people's different ways of seeing things. So you'll see very uh, unique, unique ways of looking at how we decolonize our worldviews from, from each of us, from Tim and Mackenzie. Um, I'm going to start with, uh, there was a professor in Guelph here, uh, Philip, Philip Loring, who wrote this great book recently um, called Finding Our Niche. Niche, uh, our niche toward a restorative human ecology. And in that, he says that um, all settlers have an important responsibility to our indigenous neighbors and to the land. Two of these responsibilities are decolonization and reconcilia reconciliation. And today we'll focus on decolonization of our worldviews. Arthur Manuel from the Sconlith First Nation in BC, sadly no longer with us, um, kind of 
lays out this process for us. So, um, so as far as the decolonizer process, um, what's been called upon from indigenous peoples is for us to formally denounce the racist doctrine of discovery and terra nullius. Now, I'm not gonna go into this. I think Mackenzie from Right and Saying will, will talk to this in, uh, during her presentation. The second being recognize the right to self-determination from the dependency to freedom. And all this to be in accordance with the international human rights standards that include ecological and equi equitable development principles, indigenous knowledge systems, laws, relationship to land, world views, technology, innovations, and practices. And yeah, I think that's, <laughs> as far as ecological and equitable development principles, that, that, that's something that we all, sh all should be following. Um, in this book, Phil continues to say that decolonization Decolonization means looking into all aspects of our lives, our science, our laws, our education and heritage, religion, culture, and the land for evidence of the colonial logic of supremacy and replacing it with an ethos of plural, pluralism, diversity, acceptance, and humility. So when I, when I my, my talk really to, to you, I'm, I'm reading off my notes here just so I don't miss anything, but this is going to be more of a, a narrative, and, and while I'm, I'm talking about my own my own journey, um, maybe just kind of think about some of those things that might maybe pop up that you didn't really, you know, that's like where is where is this evidence of supremacy, of feeling above something else, um, and where is this feeling of pluralism, where being included as as the whole and, and diverse and accepting of each other. So so I think you'll think you'll you'll see that as we go. Um, I'm going to share my screen. I don't have too many images, um, but I am going to um, use that to uh, <clears throat> here. So in this image here, that kind of uh, is a visual image, image that kind of illustrates that kind of difference in ways of seeing, of seeing ourselves right at the top there is at the, the pinnacle of evolution ab above everything. And I know depending on, on your upbringing and what and, and creation stories, it really sets a scene of where, where we place ourselves and especially placing ourselves above something, you know? Um, so in my story here, the other image there is, is, is human beings as part of, part of the whole in all our relations. Um, here's, here's where the story starts. Uh, this is a really good friend of mine, Chris Thomas. He's a Welsh chap. He's ended up teaching in actually Aboriginal communities in Northern Australia. And I've ended up here and he's, uh, he's really warm right now and I'm really cold. Um, but, but this is an image of, of the both of us in, in our the first or second year of university. And uh, we're in bare feet here in somewhere called Bystock Woods in, in Devon in the southwest of England. And this is kind of where this journey began for me. So I'm going to start here and kind of move backwards and then and then forwards again. Because at this point, I, I'd grown up in a city and I didn't think I'd even really seen a cow till I was about 20 years old. And a kind of a, a very urban uh, government housing estate, you know, hadn't really seen much of the world. And when we were at university, I was, we were both, both of us training to be elementary school teachers. Um, we had this program where we'd go, it was, it was, it was called uh, Earth Education. We'd go out into the forest and our, our prof would, uh, would lead us in his activities of nature connection. And one of the simplest ones was taking your shoes off. Uh, it's very grounding. I can, I, can, I can feel the cold and the mud right now. Um, but there was, that, there was the activities that kind of, you know, we went and we were blindfolded and games we played. And you really got to see nature up really close. And I had never really done that. I've never actually been in, in, a, in a, a real native forest, you know, that was uh, kind of really di bi biodiverse and healthy. So maybe that in itself was, was enough. But what happened here, which is a lot of people talk about, is this sense of coming home. Now, it could also become like, you can talk in a sense of belonging, uh, remembrance, uh, a return to Eden, uh, original instructions and awakening, or all those different things. But for the first time, I felt that I'd come home. Now, why was that? You know, I, I, was, a, I was a city boy and, and now I was in nature. And I, so I knew there was something else in me that was going on that I needed to explore. Um, 
Uh, Jan Sherman, uh, an author and storyteller in Guelph here, has been such an incredible mentor and has done so much for this community. I remember talking with her about it, with the, the school programs I was developing. And she said, Martin, it's not like a top down teaching, just like that pyramid we saw. It was actually giving kids opportunity to remember. And I've seen that not only with kids, I want to do these activities. I've seen it with adults as well, where there's this coming home. There's this kind of coming back to, to childhood, you know, this all in wonder of the world. Um, so that was something that really kind of changed my teaching. And now, even though I've got grown up kids, I, I, I have a five year old daughter now, again, who keeps me busy. I didn't think I'll have a little girl in my 50s, but besides that, um, the, the joy and kinship I witnessed in, in, her, in her world and the excitement it, it is this coming home. And this is what I witness in other people when they were in that environment. It's a coming home. So that's kind of really uh, a, a, way that, a way that we learn. We have to look and kind of inside us too but, and, and, be, and feel this kinship again. Um, moving on to go back, it's, it's kind of going, <laughs> going back in history now. I came across this photograph. It's, it's of me in 1974. Um, in a coming out, obviously been helping my, I live with my grandparents growing up. And um, so the, the kind of the, what my parents, my grandparents were, went through the war and there was lots of rations and there was this kind of digging for victory, victory. So the kind of transportation system allowed, you know, armory and all, all that sort of stuff to happen. But, it, but basically because of the rations of food, people, everyone grew their own food and they were encouraged to do so. And that rationing went right on to the mid 50s. So my grandparents were experts in intensive farming because we only had these small spaces in England. Um, so I, I was really blessed to grow up with that. And I can even remember to this day that, you know, we had chickens and fruit trees and it was just a tiny backyard. And, you know, and I remember the joy of collecting uh, scarlet runner beans, although I never really liked them that much, and seeing the seeds dry out on the windowsill at home. Uh, it kind of was very, very magical. Now, uh, growing up in a council estate, we were, we were quite a poor family. And uh, it's so funny that when I've dissected it, now I've kind of like moved away from there. Um, our family and many families of, of working class um, were considered commoners, you know, and, uh, you know, your, your family is so common, people would say. So that poor working class, I looked at the definition of it, and uh, it's like, uh, a commoner is a person ranking below another. <laughs> oh, great, that's, that's us, that sums us up. A person without title of nobility. Um, but it also it means a person who has right in the common land. And that common land was so important to many people, many people of Britain. Um, hopefully this all makes sense to you. As we go through, we had a school trip when I was, when I was young to go to Bayer in the north of France to see the Bayer tapestry. And uh, this tapestry, I think it's the longest and most intact tapestry and oldest in the world or something, you know. And, um, and in this tapestry, it, it depicts the Norman invasion of England under William the Conqueror in about, well, 1066, in fact, I remember from history. But at that time, all the land of England was taken off the people and put into the hands of the aristocracy and the church and everything was kind of given away. Now, here's a picture of the Normans raiding the, uh, the English peasant village. Um, but at that time, 30% uh, of the people were crofters. So basically, these are, this is like the, the feudal system where people were kind of tied to the land and the, the lords of the land, the landlords or gentry or the elite would, um, they would be owed. So they had somewhere to live, but they had to work the land to, to, to kind of pay back as well. 35% were cotters, which is which kind of like, again, is like farming and 10% uh, uh, of people were, were slaves and 12% of people were, were considered freemen. So even back then, you can see how the, the, that kind of ownership of the land and that hierarchy of, of, of just giving that land to work upon and not move forward. Um, by the 1500s, this is kind of like this, this, this whole social movement here is, was, was a diggers movement because these commons under Elizabeth I, they made these, they, it's called the enclosure of the commons. So this common land that people had to kind of uh, grow food on and to graze their animals on, well, that was then slowly and slowly and slowly taken away from them. 
So there's, there was a huge rebellion uh, here, and they also called the Levelers, where they stood up and said, the earth is not to be sold. The earth is not property. Land is not property. It is our given right to do this. So you can see how that's kind of uh, um, setting up. It's even worth knowing anything in kind of land-based spirituality that happened, even as far as like the Druids, who were astrologers, herbalists, mathematicians, were all wiped out by the, by the even earlier, by the Romans, because they were, they were, they were non-Christians. This is what the UK looks like today. So 30% of it, Aristotelian gentry, 80% of companies, 70% uh, of it unaccounted for, they don't even want to let you know who owns it. Uh, and new money, but then as far as the crown and the church, like the homeowners are just a tiny little bit of that. So it's incredible to see kind of that kind of that, that kind of mindset, how that stems uh, and flows into into over here. I was kind of and I was reading, I was like, well, how much of the 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 land in Canada is actually owned by the crown? It's 90%. 90% of the land is owned by the crown. Even indigenous reserves are not owned by indigenous people. It's crown land, it's held for them, it's not owned by them. You can't build equity in their own houses and pass it down to their kids or, there's nothing, it's held, there's nothing, it's, it's crown land. Even, uh, anyway, that amazes me. Um, here, uh, we, <laughs> sorry, is, uh, is John Cabot with his ship, the Matthew in the background. Um, I think Mackenzie's gonna talk about this a little bit too. But there's kind of a, this age of discovery. When I look about the education system in, in, in school, you know, I, I came here and I, and I knew nothing. And I've been here 20 years. And I remember on our honeymoon, we drove up through Manitoulin Island. And it happened to be, there was a powwow at, at Wigwamacom. And, and we went there and it was just like, just a, just a coincidence, coincidental thing. And I, I couldn't believe how naive and how ignorant I was to think, there's Indians, and, and that's the term I, I was brought up with, is Indians in Canada. I didn't even know, can you imagine? Not even knowing that. I, uh, I called upon some of my, my other teacher training friends uh, this week to see what the situation was. Like, well, what are you guys teaching at school these days? Is, is there anywhere in the English national curriculum that talks about the effects of colonization that the British have had across this world? There was nothing, there was nothing. I, kind of, I was like, it was no shock because I didn't learn it either. But it was like there was nothing there of the of, of the consequences of that. So John Cabot here, I'm from Bristol. John Cabot sailed from Bristol. And you know, this kind of the age of discovery was like exciting. It's like, there you go off, you know, how brave of you to go off and discover all these exotic new lands. And, and they actually recreated the, the, the Matthew. And there it is in Bristol docks. Bristol was like what Seville was to Spain. This is where it all happened. This is where the slaves came in, tobacco, sherry, everything else came in. But here's the Matthew. So it's like celebrating 500 years of discovering new found land. So um, uh, yeah, <laughs> okay, okay. So I, I just, these like, I, I, I'm in disbelief. That's the last way part of, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of losing my track a little bit there. So you still see today, how these kind of uh, <clears throat> these colonial views still 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 play out. This kind of notion of of people lesser than lesser than us, you know, that kind of ig that ignorance and that and a racism that takes place as well, you know, whether it's through religion or whether it's through a Eurocentric view or or like oh I, I've got you know more qualifications than you, you know, um, seeing the natural world as a lesser than you. As a, as a resource, um, seeing ways of, in, in this linear thinking of like just constantly taking, and when all that's gone, we'll go somewhere else and take it. That's what happened with colonialism. You know, the forest of England were totally stripped. Or well, rather than doing it in a reg regenerative way, we'd just take from some, somewhere else. And our economy is a bit like that too. You know, it, it feels like we're, we're just taking and taking and nothing's coming back. Um, and also seeing the earth as property. Um, I just want to read this. Um, I think from Robin Wall Kimmerich, uh, she wrote the book Brady and Sweetgrass. And I, I, I'm, a lot of people have read this book, but if you haven't, I really suggest you do. Because such a, a, a fantastic perspective of relationships. 
So I just want to read, read, uh, read this part, this, this excerpt. It's called A Source of Belonging or Belongings. Two worldviews met on this continent. Worldviews which color our relations with the living land, which shape our answer to the question, what does land mean? A worldview in which land was understood as sacred, as our sustainer, our pharmacy, our identity, our home, our library, the place where we play out our moral responsibilities in, for, in return for all our very, for our very lives, our lives, people with our non, and, and with our non-human relatives. This is the way of being which the tar sands are unthinkable. The view of the earth suddenly encountered another, another view, a kind of climate change in values, really. The whole notion of land as a set of relationships, I'm oh, sorry, <clears throat> You know, the whole notion of land as a set of relationships and moral responsibilities was replaced by the notion of land as rights and rights to land as property. And what our people called the gifts of the land suddenly became natural resources, ecosystem services and capital. Nature as family became nature as machine and our non-human relatives, our teachers became mere objects to, for consumption. This is the way of being that invites us to the tar sands. This is the same question that has us teetering on the precipice of unparalleled extinction and climate chaos. Is the land a source of belongings or a source of belongings? And really when I ask myself, why, why do we talk about this? Why are we doing this? It's exactly for all those reasons that the earth needs everyone right now. It needs, it needs all to come together. I'm just going to finish, kind of relate colonialism with the land, and I'll hand over to Tim. Um, uh, here is a, a, a forest, the old, the old growth forest project, actually. And um, with the settlers came lots of plants that worked really well in Europe. And I think that was kind of also trying to reimagine, recreate Europe here. Um, so here we've got uh, the, the European buckthorn. So in the, in the distance there, I don't know if you can see this this thick understory of buckthorn. So European buckthorn was, was uh, it's, it's really tough, it's quite thorny, um, it grows really well. And it was ideal for hedgerows for dividing land up, <laughs> remember I said about dividing land. Um, so so with, with my work, I kind of feel like, you know, I'm kind of repairing this damage of a, a colonized, colonized landscape as well. But um, repairing land, we're going to it more in the next session. Um, so this journey of learning and learning, as I said, is, has been uh, 20 years for me, but there was like, there was gaps in there where I haven't even considered this. And I know that there was so much to learn and I'm so grateful for the conversations I've had, the relationships, the friendships I've made. And there's, there's some really important readings that I, we, we collaborated with the University of Guelph and did some, uh, on, the, on their studies on indigenous relations and reconciliation with the land. And they would always send papers my way to read. Um, and, and the more and more I, I work and, and realize my own land-based spirituality, the more I, I feel that I can um, uh, do what I can. And it's a, it's, it's a long journey and I'm just, I just starting that journey. So some of the links and things like that that we have, I, I know Molly is there or Patrick will be popping some of those in. Any links to any of the resources or the books we've read or things that have really made a difference or, or videos you've watched, um, they're gonna pop into that, um, into that chat. And also we're gonna send up an email after, after, uh, after today for you to just follow that up by yourselves. So I'm gonna stop sharing that and, and say me again. And um, I'm gonna actually hand over to a good friend and colleague, Tim, well, both, um, Tim and I kind of uh, work together in the grant applications. Uh, Tim as a social ecologist and uh, a great scholar. I, I, I really I, I admire everything Tim brings to his work and continues to bring to his work. Um, Tim Alamenciak is a PhD candidate at the University of Waterloo in social and ecological sustainability. His work focuses on participation in ecological restoration. His research draws on the work of, of Ivan Illich in, um, in efforts to re-envision ecological restoration as a convenient community-led process. 
He is currently the communications manager for REAP Solutions, an environmental charity focused on helping people live sustainably in Waterloo Blue Region. So Tim, I would like to hand over to you. Thanks, Martin. That's quite a uh, setup. <clears throat> oh my. Always technology problems, eh? Uh, okay, I'm just going to share my screen here. And uh, hello, everyone. Um, the talk that I'm going to give to you is going to be about 20 minutes. I'm going to keep it short. Um, and it's called Questioning Wilderness. Um, before I start talking, I want to tell you a little bit about who I am and where I come from. Um, and before all of that, uh, just a little request for uh, Grace. If I, uh, if I forget what I'm saying or lose my spots, uh, I'm still recovering from a fairly major medical procedure about a month ago. So that would be why. Um, it's going to take a few months until I'm 100%, but I was really excited about this series. So I wanted to come and, uh, and speak with you. Uh, so where I come from, uh, I was born in Elliott Lake, which is in northern Ontario. Uh, it's about two hours west of Sudbury. I was adopted at a very young age. My adopted family comes from Poland. Uh, it's a family of miners. My grandfather came over in World War II and was a miner. Uh, my father only managed to work underground for one summer before he, uh, he went to work at the hospital um, instead. I grew up here in Kitchener, which is where I'm speaking to you from. Uh, and about three years ago, I left my career as a journalist to focus on ecological restoration as a practice. Um, I was very upset about the state of the world and the condition of the environment and restoration presented uh, for me a tangible way to do something about it. Um, so right now I'm doing my PhD part-time uh, and I'm the full-time communications manager for a company called Reap Green Solutions. Uh, we're here in Kitchener. We do a lot of home energy audits. Um, we do tree planting and things like that. Uh, so before we really dive into it, um, I'm used to participatory teaching in a university environment. Uh, I wanted to ask you folks, what is the first thing that comes to your mind when you think about wilderness? Just pop it into the chat. What's a word uh, or something that comes to mind when you think about wilderness? Fresh air, animals, natural, apex predators, that's a good one. Peace, untouched forest, a forest mystery, non-human nature doing its thing unimpeded. All right, forest, no built structures. All right. I can breathe. Uh, Mackenzie, I think you sent that just to me. Did you mean to send it to everyone? Because it is brilliant. But oh, I don't, yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't want to share it if you don't want it to. Oh. Mackenzie wrote a colonial term for our Mother Earth, which is spot on. Um, I'm sure a lot of people are imagining something like this, you know, a uh, beautiful forest with a river running through it. Um, and indeed, this is what a lot of people think about when they think about ecological restoration. So I'm speaking to you from kind of an academic context, um, really rooted in the university structures, and we love definitions. Um, and so the Society for Ecological Restoration defines its practice as this. Ecological restoration is the process of assisting the recovery of an ecosystem that has been degraded damaged or destroyed. Um, and you're going to hear a lot about this this week in some of the other presentations that you're going to be attending, um, particularly the ecologists, they might talk about something called a reference ecosystem approach. The idea is if you're going to restore an ecosystem, you need a reference to restore it to. So you need something that has the kinds of plants and animals that you want to be in your degraded site. 
A good comparison is art restoration. They often work off, uh, you know, reconstructions and older photos or sketches of a painting to try and piece it together um, and restore any of the damage that's been done. Uh, it's not a perfect analogy, but it, but it kind of works. So if you were trying to restore a farm field, uh, you might be using that forest as your reference ecosystem and trying to turn that farm field into uh, something like that big picture of the boreal. But why do we want to do that? And, and is that picture, that untouched wilderness, truly how things were? Remember this word restore. So we're trying to bring back some previous state. In the case of art, we're trying to bring back the state before that painting was torn. Um, but, but what are we doing with the land? What are we restoring it to? This is where we get into the real problem with history and why we have this idea of untouched wilderness that has perpetuated and become not just a cultural touchstone, but also something that a lot of the sciences prize and try to go towards is this um, idea of wilderness equals nature minus people. So somehow you can take the people out and then you have untouched or wilderness. Uh, and that's what we should restore to. The roots of this idea are very, very complicated. Um, when you look at history uh, and look at the way things happen, you quickly realize that the area where we are um, was not nature minus people. It was very heavily peopled. And a lot of these quotes are from a, a book uh, called The Once and Future Great Lakes Country by John Riley. It's a really good history of this region, um, the Great Lakes region. And Riley writes, in 1615, the Huron were estimated at more than 30,000 individuals in 30 towns. So those aren't, you know, villages or small, those are towns. The Piton numbered between 10,000 and 15,000. And the largest Iroquoian settlement was the neutral in the Niagara area, over 30,000 and 40 or more settlements. So that doesn't seem super untouched. It seems very heavily populated. Now, what's important here is to look at the dates. So 1615 was when some of the first early settlers came over. They brought with them disease and they brought with them programs of systematic starvation. By 1849, the number of native people from the Atlantic to the Great Lakes had declined to eight or 10,000, perhaps 5% of the number in 1600. So 1849 is a big, big colonization effort. And that's when a lot of the people who are holding the pens and writing the stories come. And the story that they write is of a land that looks untouched, um, largely because the people who used to live there were killed. Riley uses the term ecological wilding. Now, I don't think this is what most people think of when they talk about rewilding or restoration, um, but it is a dark part of the history of the term wilderness. This area was far from untouched, and yet many, many, many restoration plans proceed with this idea that we can restore a uh, quote-unquote protected or untouched idea of wilderness uh, and keep people out. The truth is um, we can't really keep people out, especially not now. People are a part of the ecosystem, whether we like it or not. Uh, and they're going to do their things. So I will uh, give you a couple of examples of restoration projects that have encountered this uh, idea. Um, so this is a picture of Snyder's Flats in Bloomingdale. It's just outside of Kitchener. Uh, pretty nice. It used to be a quarry and they trucked in a bunch of dirt and they um, did what's called passive restoration where they let the trees and the plants grow back. Um, just with very little intervention. It was a project of the Grand River Conservation Area. Um, it's quite a nice place, uh, but one of the biggest impacts is in this picture. Um, it's got four legs, 
and there are three of them on the beach. When you read the management plan for Snyder's Flats, uh, it talks about the biggest impact that they're worried about being off-leash dogs. Uh, they can reduce bird biodiversity by 30% in an area. So it can be a pretty significant impact uh, and it can be pretty hard to replicate this, you know, untouched wilderness or any kind of reference ecosystem that they're trying to hit. Um, so what did they do? They put up some signs that said, please leash your dog. Uh, nobody does. Um, it is a very, very frequently used off-leash dog park. Another restoration project that's over in Milton uh, is Glen Orkey Conservation Area. This is a, a really cool project. Uh, Halton Region Conservation did incredible work there. They restored uh, a large prairie area. Um, these areas are typically burned every couple of years uh, and then they regenerate. Um, but one of the bigger impacts that they're dealing with is not really something that would have come out uh, in a restoration plan. I mean, it's not invasive species. Uh, it's what this uh, my friend here, Peter, is holding. Um, he's holding a kite. And uh, all around this meadow, you could find kites and you could find kite string uh, just laying throughout the meadow. Uh, this is a practice and a sport known as kite fighting. Uh, it's really common in South Asia and in South America. Uh, it's a practice where people fly kites and try to cut each other's strings. Um, some people will use strings with uh, ground glass or, or a little bit more texture to try to uh, give themselves a competitive edge. Um, but these kites and these strings fall in this meadow and they cause uh, two main problems. The first is going to be problems with the animals. Um, you know, rodents could run into them, birds, snakes, everything like that um, could be severely impacted. And the second problem is it traps up the uh, ATVs that they use when they're uh, doing the prescribed burn. Um, so a practical problem, but a very social impact uh, and one that makes it hard to uh, maybe reach that goal, especially if it was interfering with wildlife in the area. Um, so kite fighting. Uh, so the, the point that I'm trying to make here is that when doing a restoration project or when thinking about a restoration project, um, this idea of untouched wilderness, it's never going to exist. Uh, it didn't exist for most of history. So we really need to start treating people as a part of the plan and a part of the ecosystem and factoring in how they're going to use or visit the area. Um, kite fighting might not be everyone's ideal nature engagement activity, uh, but people are still getting out in nature and they're still spending time in it. And so maybe there's a way we can talk to this club uh, and figure out a way that we can coexist with these people. Um, you know, untouched wilderness doesn't even exist in Northern Ontario. Anyone who's been out in the bush in hunting season, you can't go 10 steps without running into somebody else. I mean, it's uh, people are there and they're going to continue to be there. And by working with people who use the area rather than, you know, trying to um, envision nature without people as the ideal goal, uh, restorationists will have a much, much easier time. Um, so this takes planning and it takes engagement and it takes some of the things that um, might be a little bit uncomfortable, talking to people who you don't know, um, you know, approaching uh, maybe dog owners to try to figure out why do they bring their dogs there off leash and is there another place that could meet those needs um, or is it possible to confine them to a certain area uh, of the restoration project. And the key thing that, that keeps coming up is that people who are frequenting the area, they'll continue to do so even, uh, even as the project progresses. People live their lives and, and weave these places into their lives and to try to um, kind of wall off areas uh, is not going to have uh, good results in the end, especially given that a lot of restoration work that's happening uh, and a lot of um, natural areas in, in our region are in uh, heavily populated and increasingly densifying areas. 
Um, so the key is to work with people as much as possible. Um, bring them in early, bring them in often, talk to them, find out, you know, what, uh, what you can do to move forward together. And I wanted to present you one kind of idea that brings all this together uh, for me. And I, I think you'll hear uh, this in, in a lot of different words, and certainly uh, Martin already discussed it uh, a little bit, but it's this idea of values and the values we have in nature. Um, this diagram is from an academic paper, but, uh, but I think it's, it's helpful. Um, so we tend to talk about nature as having instrumental or intrinsic value. Uh, so nature can bring us something that we want. It can give us satisfaction or goods. Um, nature also has intrinsic value. It has this value independent of people. Um, nature should be valued for itself. And this, uh, diagram is from a uh, paper by Kai Chan at the University of BC. Um, and Kai has done some uh, excellent work in this area. And the paper suggests that, you know, there's a set of values that we should be keeping in mind um, that are beyond intrinsic or instrumental. And a lot of this uh, emerges from Indigenous scholars and thinkers in that area as well. Um, and it's the idea of relational values. Uh, and the paper breaks them up into to two things. So it, there's relational values between the collective uh, and nature and relational values between the person uh, and nature. And this is kind of a dense um, diagram, but the slides will be available uh, afterwards. Um, the key kind of takeaway here is that when thinking about and engaging in restoration projects, the intrinsic is no doubt important. Um, in a degraded area, you know, a gravel pit or a agricultural field that's been used for decades, there is a need to um, restore nature for its own sake, um, for the sake of the plants that need to be there and the waters. But there's also an important element around relational values that involves talking to the people who live in the area and who frequent the area. One of the first questions that I ask uh, people when I talk to conservation groups or, or uh, land trust uh, people who do the acquisition of lands and the protection of lands is what's your, what's your plan for people? Um, and I, have not had a uh, satisfactory response really. Um, generally that plan is, uh, is second or third uh, or sometimes even fourth to the ecological plans. Um, sometimes people will implement trails uh, for people to walk there, but the idea of other uses of an area is, is a difficult one, I think for a lot of people to accept. Um, in Simcoe, the Simcoe Regional Forest, you can hunt in them. Uh, that would be pretty difficult, I think, to sell at uh, Laurel Creek Conservation Area. I know the GRCA does allow hunting at uh, Luther Marsh, um, but it's, it's something that, especially in urban areas, we haven't really uh, dealt with. And when you're looking at restoring an area, I think giving good thought to how people will use the area or will engage with it afterwards uh, is a really valuable use of time and it can also help achieve any of those other restoration goals you have. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll conclude my uh, somewhat looping talk. Uh, looking forward to, uh, to any questions or further discussion and happy to pass it on to Mackenzie. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Um, yeah, there's so many, so much that came out of that uh, in our own experiences of engagement and, and values and how the Old Growth Forest Project lands are interacted with as well. So I, I think there's a couple of questions I'd like to bring up um, at, at the end there. Um, for now, um, thank you. I'm gonna pass over to um, Mackenzie. Um, so, so, Excuse my pronunciation, Mackenzie. 
Shubegini Nibish, Smiling Water, um, registered member of the Métis Nations of Ontario, specifically belonging to the Georgian Bay community, Region 7. She also has ancestral ties to Ireland, England, and France. She's currently a fourth year PhD candidate with the Chani Wenjack School of Indigenous Studies at Trent University. Mackenzie's PhD research is currently supported through an Indigenous Research Fellowship from the Rare Charitable uh, Research Reserve, a local land trust and environmental institute in Waterloo Region and Wellington. Mackenzie is a dual tradition scholar, walking in both Western and Indigenous ways of knowing and being. So um, Mackenzie, thank, thank you. And thank you for all our conversations and our, our sharings over, 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 the, over the past months. Thank you. I'm just going to share my screen. All right. So I just want to also say thank you to Tim. I really enjoyed listening to your talk. Um, and I just want to say how happy I am to hear an ecologist advocate for uh, human beings to be included in restoration. That's like, I'm like an immediate fan now <laughs> and would really love to uh, get your more of your ideas on that, actually. Um, really refreshing to hear that. Um, so thanks, Tim. And, uh, and thanks, Martin, as well. I learned a lot from your story. And I'm really happy that uh, you spoke from your own personal experiences as someone who is uh, originally from England. Um, so again, really, really cool perspective, uh, and I learned a lot. Um, so uh, my story is, um, I should preface it with, this is just my story. Um, it, it comes from personal experiences as well as academic ones, I guess. Um, I don't speak on behalf of my nation or my community. Uh, so even though I'm a Métis woman, I, I, I don't speak on behalf of, of my community. It's, uh, I'm not a, a government representative at all. So um, just thought I'd put that out there first. Um, really the, the point of me uh, taking a more storytelling approach uh, with you today is to privilege uh, an indigenous method of, of learning and teaching. Um, and, and it's really to, to create uh, the atmosphere or the, the conditions for remembrance. Uh, so I really hope that my story elicits memories, uh, remembrance, uh, knowledges that you guys, you know, might have. And, uh, you know, something that will hopefully help us connect uh, in our community of practice here. So she might for having me. Um, Shubihini Nibish Indigenakas, Nin Nishnabe Metikwe. So I'm Smiling Water or Mackenzie. Uh, I'm from Georgian Bay Metis. I'm also French, English, and Irish. Um, these are some of my ancestors on the screen here. Uh, so our community specifically, um, I'm from sort of like French, like fur trader voyageurs mixed with Anishinaabe women. Um, so uh, we were heavy, heavily involved in the fur trade um, in the uh, late 17, early 1800s. And uh, originally, um, it's hard to say where home is because we've kind of uh, flopped around a little bit. Um, you know, for a time, my family lived in Red River, Manitoba, uh, but then moved to Drummond Island. And uh, uh, after the uh, War of 1812, when the Americans won, um, they basically took possession over Drummond Island and kicked us all out. <laughs> so then we moved, uh, our, our sort of like special migration story is, is, is from when we moved from Drummond Island to uh, what's now known as Penetanguishin. Um, and that's where my dad grew up, that's where my mamere grew up, um, her mamere and her mamere. Uh, so we've been living in that area for about just over 200 years now, and that's where I would probably call home at this point. <clears throat> so I just wanted to start off with a little bit of, um, I'm not going to say boring stuff, but like 
more uh, academic stuff so that we're all on the same page about terms. Uh, this is the academic side of me. Um, so what is a worldview? It's philosophies of life uh, held by individuals or groups. Um, and worldviews are made up of a lot of different things, but one of the main influences of someone's worldview would be their knowledge system. And everybody has a unique knowledge system. Uh, they're kind of, they're a combination of these ologies, which are fancy words uh, to describe sort of how we see the nature of our reality, how we perceive ourselves as having life um, in our relationship to the cosmos and uh, sort of like whether you believe in God or, or creator or, you know, that would be kind of like your ontology, how you perceive your own reality. Um, epistemology is a fancy word for um, your ways of coming to know. So this might include like reading, like we all, you know, we all have our phones. This is probably one of the main ways of knowing that we have these days is through our phone. Uh, and axiology, which is sort of the values or morals attached to how we come to know, how we come to know, how we develop our knowledge, um, and how we go about uh, building knowledge or having remembrance. Um, what is colonization? Uh, I'm grateful that Martin and uh, Tim spoke a little bit about this, uh, but from uh, I took this actually right out of my PhD um, comprehensive exam. Uh, so colonization requires taking control of Indigenous lands, uprooting the people, and importing settler bodies for the purpose of harvesting resources. In the case of Canada, the settlers never left, they, they settled. So in Canada, we also call uh, the form of colonization here as settler colonialism because um, the settlers stayed with us, um, which is also why there's Métis people. So I'm not too unhappy about that. I'm, I'm actually quite happy about that. Uh, but it's sort of the conditions of staying that, that we're probably going to uh, want to unpack a little bit. Um, just wanted to mention that colonization was structured. It was a structured process. Um, and it's centered around Christendom, which is uh, a combination, sort of like a relationship between the church and the state um, that ultimately uh, was formed through the doctrine of discovery and a bunch of PayPal bulls. Um, so just to give you like kind of an idea of what happened in the 1400s, um, there was a pope named Nicholas. Um, and uh, he gave a king the right to enslave uh, and take ownership of any non-Christian peoples that lived in these territories uh, that were being explored. Um, so at that time, Christopher Columbus existed, um, and he then therefore got the right to discover America. Um, and when he discovered the Americas, there were millions of people living there at the time. Um, so it really wasn't a discovery, um, but we call it that, and that's often the discourse um, in school if you learn about it at all. Um, and anyways, um, the, the purpose is, is colonization is really rooted in the project of dehumanization. So um, ultimately the colonization of Canada was rooted in seeing indigenous peoples as less than human because they were not Christian. Um, so not the greatest. So how does this sciences, um, how are the sciences sort of in relationship to colonialism in Canada? And why is decolonization so important? Um, so if like myself, most of you have probably been um, educated within the dominant system in Canada. Um, so because Canada is a colonial and imperial country, um, these are some of the themes that you might have been taught in school. Uh, so othering, um, notions of humans being primitive versus advanced, or maybe like a class system. Um, humanism, so the elevation of humans over other species, which uh, Martin and Tim touched on, 
rationalism, again, um, that knowledge can really only be obtained through, through reasoning of the mind. Um, scientism, so the prediction and control of nature um, and materialism, so the value in material possessions. Um, so how, how is science related to this? Uh, so often these systems have been supported by sciences and uh, Christian religious institutions, uh, especially through uh, resource management. Um, and this has led to uh, interests in assimilation. So, so having everybody in Canada be the same, um, you know, uh, this control over politics, economy, even the concept of time. You know, we, we have daylight savings time. We were very controlling over time. Um, the need for problem solving, uh, so problematizing everything, uh, efficiency, productivity, these are the kinds of things, um, uh, this is how um, these things are sort of related and, and, and how sometimes uh, enmeshed in, in these original um, crusades. So I've just, I've included here uh, some of the resources, because I know that was kind of a lot, uh, some resources that helped me understand colonialism in Canada, if you guys are at all interested in additional reading, I would highly, highly, highly recommend these four books. Um, I've read many, but I would say those four are probably my favorite and the best at describing the complexity here. So on to um, my story. So this is really a story about how my worldview and my knowledge system has transformed over my short life of 32 years. <clears throat> so growing up, I learned um, ancestral land-based practices from my parents and my grandparents or my papere and my mamere. Um, however, at that time, even though those ancestral land-based practices were quite strong in my family, um, it was understood at a very young age that I needed to go to school and I needed to become uh, successful in the sciences and math in particular um, because it was understood like my dad, my mamere, um, that these are the things for successful living in Canada today. Um, even though my family has a rich connection to the land and we had, we have these, we have these amazing land-based practices, um, those were kind of just like the accessories of life. The focus was you need to go to school, you need to, you know, sort of essentially assimilate. <clears throat> so that's what I did. Um, I took on assumptions uh, and different aspects of knowledge systems that I would say now were definitely not my own. Um, so some of the assumptions that I that I took, I went to the University of Guelph and I did my, my uh, Bachelor of Science in Plant sciences, and then I did my master's in uh, plant agriculture. So I was obsessed with plants, loved plants, um, but instead of my love of plants being uh, a motivator for getting these degrees, degrees done, it soon be became a part, like sort of, it soon became that I had to adopt uh, certain aspects of these knowledge systems that maybe weren't intuitive or, or something that I was comfortable with. So just to give you an idea, some of the assumptions I had to make while being a scientist was that whatever um, we can see and measure, we can know. This idea that I can be objective, um, I can separate myself from my experiments, and, and, and that's true knowledge, and it's completely separate from me as long as I follow these protocols correctly. Um, some of the values that I had to embody uh, were that plants are less important than human life because there was absolutely no ethics process that I needed to engage in when I did my schoolwork. Um, I'm not responsible for knowledge that I create um, and the communication of the knowledges that I'm learning in school doesn't have to be accessible to everyone. Um, it really only matters that the people who are funding my research like it and know about it and can understand it. Um, so some of the methods of coming to know would be observation, replication, measurement, and categorization and isolation. However, I soon um, sort of took me, 
took me a few years to figure it out, but I started to feel uncomfortable with um, certain aspects of these knowledge systems, uh, especially the harming of, of plants for knowledge. So um, I started, this became sort of heightened when I started engaging with elders and indigenous knowledge keepers. And I started my journey of, of returning to my roots or returning to um, my indigeneity. So especially because I started to learn in ceremony actually that there were things that I could ask these plants and know without harming them. Uh, so I started to sort of realize, oh, there's, there's some values associated with, with scientific knowing that, that I don't have to participate in, that I can know um, in different ways. Uh, so yeah, again, I started learning with indigenous uh, teachers. Um, these are some of the things that they taught me that empirical sciences didn't exactly cover. Uh, so everything is animate, even the rocks. In sciences, we learn that there are inanimate things and animate things. And, um, and according to the teachings that I've received is everything's animate. Um, everything's in constant flux. And our languages, our original languages, uh, ex uh, express this movement. So that's why a lot of Indigenous languages are verb-based, whereas English is more noun-based. It's sort of about things, and um, whereas Indigenous knowledges explain that movement because there's an understanding that everything's in flux constantly. Even the rocks are, are vibrating at subatomic particle level. Uh, we're all connected in that web of relationships. Um, so there's no hierarchy. There's no... Um, it's, it's we're all in this circle. Uh, there was a shift in thinking around my responsibilities versus my right to something. Um, really, uh, it, it became a discourse around what am I responsible for? Um, and as a human being, especially a scientist, it was about what are my human responsibilities to the continuation of life? And if you're, um, well, I mean, you don't have to be a scientist to know that as human beings, the conditions for us to survive on earth are actually quite narrow. Uh, you know, we need water, we need air, we, we're very dependent on everything. Uh, so, and as, you know, the indigenous elders like that I work with, they they have this, this inherent knowing of this. And, and so it's, it's maintaining those conditions and, and those derive from our responsibilities, not our rights, because um, it's a miracle that we're even here. Um, there's no such thing as new knowledge. Um, this idea that we can discover something or, or that we can come up with something novel or new, they would say, no, it's just remembrance. The earth knows, you know, our knowledge has come from the earth. The earth is old and she knows. So it's not new, we're just learning that from her or she's helping us birth that knowledge within us. Um, and we access that through our uh, spiritual and physical connection to the earth. Um, so yeah, and of course, now I don't believe in objectivity at all. I believe that everything is subjective and all of our knowledges are perceived. <clears throat> So where do Indigenous knowledges come from? Um, they come from relationships. Again, they come from those relationships that we have with the plants, the animals, the rocks, each other. Uh, they come from oral stories, uh, philosophies, original instructions. Um, they even come through uh, songs, uh, which is kind of neat, and of course our languages. And they also come from uh, ceremony as well, or from spirit. Uh, so we access those things by participating in like fasting or moon ceremonies, sweat lodges, um, even actually just taking your tobacco um, and having a relationship with prayer and with creator uh, and creation on your own is, is ceremony. Um, one of the elders that I work with actually says breathing is ceremony. Like it's, it's sacred. Bre our breath of life is sacred. So then my my learning began to shift. I started working more intensely um, with a few elders. And instead of scientific ways of knowing, I started to shift to the medicine, the paradigm of the medicine wheel, um, which is a more holistic way of, of knowing that's rooted in um, Anishinaabe, 
ways of being. And um, I know this is kind of complicated, but the the what I wanted to impart um, about the medicine wheel or about the paradigm is um, this isn't the only aspects of the paradigm. This is just a few things that I've plugged in there. But um, if you could picture the medicine wheel being kind of like a spiral up or a spiral down, like it's um, it's sort of endless. It's sacred geometry. Uh, but what what I'd like to impart is a shift from nurturing my mind to nurturing my mind, my body, my spirit, and my heart. So as a knowledge, as someone who's seeking knowledge, I'm using all parts of who I am, not just my mind, not just reason, or not just physical interaction, things that we can measure physically. So that was a huge change in my way of knowing. Uh, and then also the medicine wheel teaches us um, sort of how we can obtain knowledge. Uh, so the teaching specifically that I have is that you have a vision of something first. You ask to know something and you have a vision of that. Then you develop a relationship with it until you develop the knowledge that you need about that thing. And then you act on it. So there's a responsibility to act with knowledge comes action. It's not knowing and then hoarding knowledge somewhere or writing it in a paper that, you know, that other people won't ever be able to read or to know. It's, it becomes part of you. It becomes your movement. And you're expected to move that into the world, not just talk about it or write about it, but it's supposed to change you. Our names also, um, dictate our responsibilities to certain knowledges and to certain actions that are attached to knowledges. So for example, my name is Smiling Water. Um, I have a responsibility to understand and have a relationship to the water. So that informs um, some of what I know. Also clan responsibilities play a huge role in, uh, the, in the knowledges that we are responsible for. Um, so, for example, uh, I've been adopted into the Bear Clan Nation, uh, or Bear Clan, sorry, um, in the Anishinaabe Nation, uh, because as Métis people, some of us have lost our clans. Uh, so one of those clan responsibilities of the Bear Clan people is to the plant medicines. So spending time with them, understanding uh, the cycles, how, uh, you know, how to harvest medicines, how to you know, and this is sweet grass or, you know, sweet grass, tobacco, cedar, all of these sacred medicines and developing unique relationships to them and getting to uh, being able to get to know them enough so that you can provide those things to the people that need them. And also uh, a new connection that I have with knowledge is accessible communication. Uh, so I, have always been a creative person. Uh, I'm a beater. And I started to bead what my relationship to knowledge, uh, like how that's changed, and also my relationship to other beings. Um, so I have a unique relationship to the porcupine. I incorporate um, the porcupine into some of my beadwork. Um, the deer, the rabbit, you know, these things that, that were part of our, um, part of our culture and part of our history because those relationships, we understood those to be so intertwined. So I'm trying to include those elements in, in my creativity and in uh, those connections that I have. I wanna represent them differently, not just on paper, but in physical form, in wearable art, uh, because ultimately we wear our teachings, we move our teachings, we move our knowledges. And so when we wear those things, we're reminded of those connections that we have. Knowledge needs to be accessible to young people. This is another thing that I've learned on my journey is, and I've had dreams about this, if young people aren't involved, if they don't have a seat at these tables where we're talking about really important parts of the earth that they are ultimately inheriting after us, they need to be there. They, it needs to be accessible and understandable for them. Um, because they're going to be those ones that are caretaking next. So it's really important um, for me and my research uh, to involve young people. 
uh, which is something I didn't do as a scientist. So these are some of the academic resources, again, that helped me to understand um, some of the intricacies about knowledge systems, about how we come to know, about the values that we attach to knowledge. Uh, these would be great resources for you if you wanted to learn a bit more. Uh, and something that I also wanted to mention um, was that knowledge isn't sort of in this vacuum. Uh, it's socially created. So people create knowledge. Um, it, knowledge is birthed within us. It's birthed in the earth. Um, and it's attached to people. So that's why knowledge can be so powerful is because it can become political. And these two resources, I'm not going to touch on them a huge amount, but they speak to um, decolonizing uh, knowledge um, and also decolonizing structures that, that hold knowledges like universities and stuff like that. Um, and how to... Uh, share power around knowledge is better uh, so that um, so that everybody has a seat at the table and all of their knowledges are present and not just the dominant ones. So now I'm a dual tradition scholar. I, I, I had a great elder remind me today, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, even though I was a scientist for a long time, I'm not, you know, getting rid of it entirely. I still um, honor the methods of knowing, such as reading, writing, and asking questions. Um, I just don't experiment anymore. I don't want to harm uh, anything anymore to get knowledge. Uh, so I do the less, what I would consider the less harmful approaches of knowing. Um, and, then I, and then I really have embodied, and I'm trying to embody more and more every day, um, Indigenous methods of knowing um, that are more connected to my ancestors, um, that are more connected to the work that I'm doing with the elders, uh, my beadwork, um, and participating in, in those ancestral practices. If you want to know a little bit about what I'm doing, um, I'm a fourth year PhD candidate. Uh, because I've gone through this unique journey with a transformation of the way that I think and come to know, I'm actually taking a look at those spaces where diverse people come together and they're trying to make environmental decisions with Indigenous people, with scientists, with policymakers. Um, and I'm trying to uh, ask the question, um, how is that going in those spaces? You know, with all these diverse thinkers, there's bound to be problems, especially because there's still colonialism in these spaces. There's still violence in these spaces. Even though we're professionals, um, some, some of that can creep into the work that we do when we're making decisions together. So I'm taking a look at how that's going in Ontario. And the reason why I'm motivated to do that is because of my own personal experiences. So even though um, it's 2021, I've experienced racism, sexism, sexual violence, gaslighting, tokenism, you name it, my human rights have been violated. Um, in these professional spaces. Uh, so I'm really motivated to solve that problem and hopefully help find solutions to how we can work better. Um, and one of those things is, is again, decolonizing and how important it is uh, to return to those relationships to Mother Earth um, and remove that hierarchical thinking. Uh, so um, we need everybody's support in making that happen. And part of my work is, is hopefully making this accessible to um, diverse knowers that come from all different kind of perspe uh, perspectives. So anyway, I've probably talked too long. So Jimmy Kutch, uh, big thanks for, for everyone listening. And um, I'm open to any questions that you might have. Kenzie, thank you so much. Tim, thank you so much. Um, there, there's so much to, to learn on the, the different stages of our journeys, whether we're just beginning to think about these things. Um, I, I know sometimes, I think what, what the Indigenous lead at the Upper Grand Visit School Board said to me, like, say, people don't know what they don't know. And it's kind of by having these conversations and these discussions that you begin to question the things that you just take for granted or your bias or assumptions. And the purpose of this, this sharing is, 
is is, is a coming together and taking a, a, a wider view as possible in how we can engage and take care of each other, be kind to each other, be kind to ourselves, and and and, and be, be kind to this beautiful earth of ours because it's those windows of opportunity of of, of uh, taking care of it are are becoming smaller, unfortunately. So I'm gonna. I think there was a, a, couple, a couple of questions that popped up in the Q&A there. Um, I'm going to hand over to Patrick, so I'm not going to uh, facilitate that. And then Patrick's going to throw some questions at us, and hopefully maybe they're directed at someone in particular. Uh, and maybe we can answer them or not answer them. I'm not sure. Thank you, Patrick. Yeah, thank you so much. And um, just a reminder, there is space in the Q&A. Um, if you go down to the bottom of your uh, Zoom screen, there is an option that's Q&A and you can type a question in there. Um, if that's not accessible to you, then you can also try the chat, which you would ex access the same way. Um, so the first question that we have up here is from Mackenzie. Um, can you speak more to knowledge gained through the medicine wheel, specifically about building a relationship with knowledge? Yeah, so... Um... I should have probably mentioned self is at the center of the paradigm of the medicine wheel. So if you can kind of picture it like you're in a water tube <laughs> and the medicine wheel is all around you uh, and you have those, those parts of yourself that are always there. Um, the ways in which I gather knowledge myself using the paradigm of the medicine wheel is first and foremost, I need to be well. I need to be taking care of my physicality, my mind, my spirit, and my heart. And there's practices, daily practices that I engage in keeping myself well. Because I think also as Indigenous people, well, I mean all people, but especially Indigenous people, we have trauma. We have intergenerational trauma. Um, we're dealing currently with systemic racism still. You know, it's in our face every day. It's in the news all the time. So being well is like paramount. And then I apply um, vision, having, you know, so so I include a lot when I'm asking for knowledge, when I'm, when I'm trying to understand and come to know, I'm asking creator, I'm putting my stemma down. I'm asking for that vision to come, for that enlightenment to come or to be birthed within me. Um, and then once that happens, I develop a relationship to what that is. What is what has come? What am I responsible for when it arrives? Because knowledge isn't, again, uh, it's attached to those responsibilities. Um, uh, and then um, and then so so then I have the knowledge. I'm responsible for that knowledge. And then I act. So um, if that involves incorporating changes in me, that's how it comes out in action or it comes out, for example, like in advocacy, um, in I could write about it, blog about it, uh, share it. Um, that's where like, I'd like to make those connections with youth as well. Through my action, I wanna be making sure that those teachings or that, you know, that knowledge that I've asked for is getting to the places where it needs to be. Because ultimately, the way that we see that through the paradigm of the medicine wheel is we're a vector for that. It's not our knowledge. It's our ability to, um, turn that knowledge into collective action. Uh, so if that answers your question, but first things first is wellness. Wellness is key. <laughs> yeah. um, thanks, Mackenzie. If I could just uh, follow up on that question with another one while we're still on it. Um, so the medicine wheel is uh, an Indigenous teaching. How can we learn from or engage with Indigenous knowledge respectfully and not just take from it as settlers? Yeah, so um, I think engaging with Indigenous knowledges respectfully is about engaging with Indigenous peoples respectively because Indigenous knowledge isn't separate from the knower. Like that's another... Um, that's another difference I think that, that exists between maybe like old Euro Western concepts of knowledge that we've inherited as a country versus uh, indigenous knowledges is they're not sort of like out here for us to like pay for and have. 
their indigenous knowledges are, like I said, birthed. They're, they're, so remembrance is like a birthing process within myself. So if I have, so as an indigenous person, if I have knowledge, if you engage with me respectfully, I'll likely share with you this, this knowledge. And hopefully, like I was saying at the beginning of the presentation, it, it helps to give you remembrance. Um, it's not necessarily something that you attach to and then and then have. It's sort of meant to create movement within you um, and within your unique connection to the earth. I don't know if that makes sense, but yeah, respectfully engaging with Indigenous peoples is, is respectfully engaging with those knowledges. Thank you. Um... Yeah, so I'm gonna move into a little bit of a different line here. I'm gonna start with Tim on this question, and then I think it would be very cool to kind of open it up a little more. Um, so Tim, I'm wondering, how do we restore with humans as part of the ecosystem? Like, what does that look like? So for instance, um, you talked about that grassland. What would that grassland look like and how would it be different with those kite flyers, for instance, in mind? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really good question because um, sometimes people do some really harmful things and, and they get pretty attached to those um, behaviors. But uh, a lot of the work that we do at REAP is around this idea of sustainable behavior and fostering sustainable behavior. Um, you know, I gave, I gave the example of uh, at Snyder's Flats, they put up the signs that said, leash your dog um, signs don't work we we know that people don't listen to them um, and sometimes they can make things worse uh, but um, you know it's it's really about engaging uh, with people and having that dialogue um, and and building a relationship uh, there and that and that can be really difficult uh, especially if you don't have skills in that area um, you know, I'm not sure what that grassland would look like. I mean, maybe the kite flying club agrees to do a sweep and pick up all the strings afterwards every time, um, and they're able to keep flying kites there. Um, maybe that's a potential future, um, but that's resources for them. That's going to take them, you know, an hour or so after, and, and it takes a relationship to make that ask and say, you know, could you guys do this? Uh, this big cleanup, um, but uh, but it can be difficult and, and it takes a lot of resources. I don't know if there's a, a perfect answer to that, but uh, you know, there's lots of ideas, I guess. Thanks, Tim. Mackenzie or Martin, do you have thoughts on this? Yeah, those those uh, those relationships are, are like Tim was talking about are kind of the the, the best way to go. Um, but then it's a matter of resources. I know every time we're out on the trails and, uh, you know, someone's got the dog off the leash, you know, it's almost like the teacher's coming along and they put it on quick and then when we're gone, they'll take it off. Or you see other people kind of like, there's a lot of stuff that happens when you're not there or after, after dark. There's a lot of mischief that happens. And, you know, and you can, for all the signs, we've noticed ourselves putting all these signs up. And also it just doesn't look nice. There's signs everywhere saying, don't do this, don't do that, don't do, you know. So it's, it's trying to find ways of uh, teaching people how to positively in, engage, you know, and hopefully, you know, it, it, does, it does start with the young kids, but it starts with them being out there and being in those conversations and hopefully uh, carrying it through. Um, there's lots of people, especially during COVID, that haven't uh, had turned to nature and turned to natural spaces as the only place they could be. And I think there is, you know, I mean, that's really encouraging to realize that, these places offer this kind of like this physical and this mental and this spiritual kind of uh, rejuvenation for people. But it's like, you know, when you're connecting to those space, spaces for the, for the first time or a new time, the, the associated values, values with that aren't present. So you, you're interacting in, in, you know, irresponsible ways. You know, there's a, there's a group that go fishing where we, at the, at the Old World Forest site. And it's great, you know, it's so fantastic. The group of people getting together and fishing, but there's just garbage and, and worm packets and everything everywhere, every single time. And it's like, we're, there's, a, there's a disconnect here. So how, how you bring that in, I don't know. I know England during this time, all the national trust areas and stuff have been totally trashed during COVID. And it's just like, 
it's great that people are out there, but how do you engage in those conversations? And I can't just sit in the forest all day. I'd like to <laughs> and talk to these people. But um, yeah, it's a really, the resource side of it's really, really hard. But maybe it starts with the younger ones. Um, Mackenzie, do you have thoughts on this? There's also a follow-up question uh, in here that you might have an answer to as well, which is, um, or I mean, anybody, does, has anybody, sorry, Mackenzie, did you have thoughts on this first? Um, I was just going to say, I think it's a, I think it's a fundamental issue in, like, I often think about this, like I think about this a lot, probably every day. Um, it's like, how do we cultivate better human beings? Um, and I don't wanna say cultivate, cause that sounds kind of like, like a resource or something, but um, like, I'm kind of like what I was saying, Canada was built on imperialism and colonialism. And not a lot of our education system in Canada is focused on values and knowledges that are that are fundamental to creating a connection, like a positive one with nature or like with our mother. Uh, we don't even refer to her as our mother. Like, you know, like when I think of like how I see the earth, like, there's a sensitivity there, right? Like when you, cause I, I grew up as well in Canada learning the same things. Like, you know, it's important to be competitive. It's important to have power over others and uh, be the best. And, you know, um, like fast, everything's fast, 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 you know, and you gotta be, at, you know, across the finishing line first. And I think like our goals are skewed because our, because the system continues to perpetuate really harmful and oppressive tendencies in people. So like, I think that's why it's like important to have this decolonization, like our systems are rooted in privileging certain beings and disadvantaging many. So unless that's changed, I think we're going to continue to be perpetuating people that have a disconnect or that don't value those things, those not things, those beings. Thank you. Um, and then kind of a follow up for everyone. Um, can you think of examples of ecological restoration or land management that incorporate other ways of knowing, such as from spirit? I don't see anyone moving first, so I'm going to direct this towards Martin. <laughs> Thanks, Patrick. <laughs> um, well, I mean, there's a, there's, a, there's a kind of spirituality in the, in, in the practice, in, in the practice of um, looking at landscape. And I, I remember when Tim and I were walking the forest, and I met we did this in our video, actually, we were saying, like, what are you thinking about, Tim, when you look at that, you know? And I'm 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 constantly like jogging, like looking at it to see where it's where the health is and what it needs help with, and and I and but by knowing the plants, by knowing the individual stories, by knowing all the connections, you know you, you can't help but look upon this landscape with awe and wonder. So when you talk about ecological activities, um, if you can provide that narrative while you're doing it and, and celebrate some of the things that you come across um, with that pure love of the land. Um, I think it's quite infectious, you know. I remember my my journey of kind of looking at this, where we used to work with a lot of our students in, in in Guelph, and we'd go out and do a big tree planting project, and they like put loads of trees on the ground, and it's kind of like almost like not slave labor, but it was like you kind of like come on, let's get them all in, you only got like ten minutes left, da, da, da. and then they would go and get back on the bus, and there was no narrative there, there was no read, there was no like why am I doing this? What are all the connections? What's going to be the benefits here? You know, they just kids just planted a forest that will be there when, when they're older and their kids are older. You know, you have to like just slow down and pay attention to all the um, amazing gifts, all the amazing interactions, 
and every hand that people have in in making this this world a better place that needs to be celebrated and it needs to be from a point of gratitude um to them and uh, remind them of like how amazing they are so that's that's how i kind of weave that into the ecological restoration Thanks, Martin. Does anyone else have a follow up on that at all or thoughts? Sorry, Tim. Oh, go ahead. I, uh, I have a little bit of familiarity with the tracks program at Trent. Um, I've, I haven't actively participated in tracks, but I've heard excellent things from anybody that's been in relation to the tracks program. It's uh, it's sort of rooted in indigenous knowledges and knowledge systems of the land. It's run out of Peterborough, but I would maybe look into tracks as like a really great example of um, young people engaging in indigenous and sort of scientific uh, ways of of having relationships with the land because. You know, science is a great way to have a relationship with the land. Um, you know, it's like, I'm not anti-science at all. Like, I think it's a great tool to understand the land. It's just um, on my journey, it, it just hasn't, it's kind of like had its life and um, it's, had its, it's had its day. <laughs> and I'll leave it up to uh, scientists that do it better than I do. <laughs> So I would say tracks is a great example of, of how to do this really well. Um, I didn't know about that program before, so I'm glad to hear about it. They're doing great things in Peterborough. Uh, one of the things that Mackenzie said about how we have these systems, um, I think really rings true. And especially with this question, um, you know, if, if there is a spirit based land management uh, activity, it's going to have to have a scientific component just by law because of the structures of the government. Um, so if you have a land trust, which is one of the only ways to get land donated, um, you still need to file like annual ecological reports. Um, and so, you know, the conservation and restoration work is embedded in this larger system that, um, you know, while there may be uh, funding for different types of management, when the rubber hits the road, there's going to be annual reporting requirements um, that kind of prop up those um, colonial land management regimes. So. I don't know. I don't think that answers the question, but it's just something that that crossed my mind is is these systems kind of keep us locked on this track um, or try to anyways. One of the ways that I've had success um, at Rare, working for Rare, because I was um, before I was a student, I was an outdoor um, education facilitator uh, there. And one of the ways that I was able to leverage um, some funding for uh, in, embedding spirit-based practices in some of the education that we do at Rare was I challenged some local funders about their responsibility in reconciliation and making funding more available to different ways of knowing that would be in alignment with their responsibilities as community organizations to local reconciliation movements and had some success there. So if you're wondering. All right, thank you so much. So um, we are uh, going to need to start wrapping up here. Um, so I am just going to pass it off to Martin right now. Uh, that was a great conversation. <laughs> um, everything that what, what you brought, Mackenzie, and, and what you've brought, Tim, and what so many other people bring to that table into kind of unpacking all this and, 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 and to move 
forward in respectful ways um, in which you can really make change. And it's, it's such a, um, yeah, yeah, I, 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 yeah, I can't say, I can't say enough. Uh, I, mostly for like, you know, the, the conversations that we've had even coming to this, this point. So just to share them on this, uh, I'm, I'm really grateful that people have spent some of their evening uh, to be uh, part of this conversation um, and this discussion. And hopefully that opens up just a lot of smaller windows in different places of like, oh, okay, I never really considered that. Or, or looking at your own your own histories and your own own roots and own ancestry. And I never really did that until I had conversations with Mackenzie. Like this common, these commoners, these common family, you know, why would I bother looking at my ancestors? You know, my actual, my original name before I changed it, Tammy was my grandfather's name, Doak, I looked it up. It was a son of a servant <laughs> of Saint Saint Cadoc of Scotland. I was like, oh, what a great name to carry through, <laughs> you know. So but there's so many things to, to, to think about. There's so many things to think about when you see people out on landscape, walking on trails, um, you know, have a conversation with people, to talk about it and say, you know, how much you, even, even how much you love a space and how much you're grateful for that space and, and check in with them, you know. You'd be surprised at conversations you have uh on the trails so um thanks to everybody um the, the, the discussion continues on thursday when we look at kind of reconciling and looking at more again uh, what actions come forth from those this ways of thinking and reconciling with the land and and and, and indigenous peoples um yeah full of gratitude uh thank you everybody and uh tune in soon bye